Welcome back to the shop. I'm Jason and I'm a new Tesla owner. So what's the first thing you do after you get an electric car, a Tesla or any EV basically? Well, you start driving it, you start having a ton of fun and then you realize, oh crap, I don't have any way to put fuel or in this case, electrons into the car. So for me, what I decided to do was get a wall connector, which you can see here. Now, one of the problems with the wall connector is it's hardwired. Now I say that's a problem because it's only a problem for me. I really don't want to hardwire it. I've got a ton of power in my corner here for doing all sorts of shop activities. Now you see Tesla specifically says cord extension sets are not allowed to be used. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use a cord extension. This is a NEMA 650, which means I have three conductors. Well, two conductors and a ground. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wire this in to my connector so that I can use it where I use my 50 amp for my welder and my large plasma cutter. Now, I know that there's a lot of uh, super smart people out there that are gonna post down in the comments all the NEC violations that this is probably going to be. And I understand that. So what I'm saying is I'm not an electrician. You're probably not either, but if you are, cool. Let me know down in the comments. I'm gonna do this anyhow. I'm already using a 25 foot four gauge extension cable for my welder that I also run to the other side of the shop over here and plug into an oven to run for powder coating. So in my shop, I'm probably doing a lot of things that you really shouldn't be doing anyhow, but they all work and I do them at my own discretion and try to stay safe the best that I can. So we'll do a couple of things once we get this plugged in. We're gonna use my infrared gun to see what kind of heat we're generating to make sure that everything is safe. And I'm going to watch it and derate it so that it's gonna be safe in the long run. What I found is that with, I believe this is 24 feet long, if I set up the wall connector amongst this mess of everything else, my electrical panel is actually right here behind the wall on the outside of the building. I've got enough room to reach around the corner here to charge the car all the way up here if I back in. And if I move my race car out of the way over here, all the way to right here to plug in. Ideally, I'd want the wall connector right here in the middle of the garage, because then I could charge in this spot, this spot, or that spot. But that's gonna be about $400 more in just materials to get the conduit and the wiring all the way over here. That's not even paying somebody else to do it, which I wouldn't do anyhow. I would run it. So for now, we're gonna mount it to the wall right over here. You really should have worn your I void warranty shirt. <laughs> yeah. Take a look down below at the links. I have a shirt that says I void warranties, which theoretically is what we're about to do. Now I have seen plenty of other people not run 650s, but run the 1450, which is a conventional plug that you would find on a oven, on a dryer or any other large amperage device in a house that's plugged in. That has four prongs, ground, hot, hot, and neutral. The neutral doesn't even get used and you have to cut it off in here anyhow. So I didn't think that was necessary to convert my plug and run adapters and things like that. When I can run a heavy duty, you can see this thing is very heavy duty, six gauge wiring, super heavy duty plug, rated for 50 amps. We're only gonna be pulling about 40, like I said, because we're gonna derate in the app. So I know I have a stud right here because I mounted all my shelves. I know that this outlet goes down because I have my access panel from my electrical panel on the back. And this is a ground that I ran as a secondary ground straight down to earth for when I'm powder coating so that I can hook up and get a much better ground signal. So I've been in here quite a bit in the past. Right here should work fantastic. So to get our unit mounted to the wall, we've got our template here with three different options for how you can mount it. So three different holes, depending on which entry point you decide to use. If it's on the front, you can pick any set of holes. And if it's on the back, you got to offset back here. We're gonna be using the center holes because we're gonna make a bottom entry into the unit. And we're gonna pre-drill with a 5 30 seconds bit. I've got my wall lined up already with a laser so I can throw this up there and get to drilling. All right, so our next step is we gotta get the cover off. And the cover had this handy dandy little strap on it when I was unboxing it. And I took it off. So I'm just going to pop it out here because this is actually what we're mounting to the wall. And for me, I'm gonna be popping out the bottom plug here to run my wires in. 
So we're gonna pre-drill our two center holes so it'll hold up to the wall. Then we're gonna put our extension cord in to get it plugged up. All right, so our plug pops out the bottom. This is gonna be our moment of truth because I actually haven't tested this yet to see if this is gonna fit. It should, okay. It does fit just like that. And we want the wires to come up and bend around and to here. Will it fit right here though? It will not fit right there with the sheathing on there. Now, typically you only want sheathing to penetrate into a box about a quarter of an inch. And all of you super astute observers will have already noticed I don't have a strain relief on there. So I've got two different style strain reliefs that I'm gonna give a shot. This one is a push strain relief. So it pops in and locks in manually. And then this one is a screw in, which I think is gonna be the route I go here. This is a three quarter inch knockout. So I have a three quarter inch strain relief. And the reason that we use this is whether or not we were hard wiring or we had our cord coming out, what we don't want is to apply any pressure to our conductors inside the unit. We want everything to be retained here. So the strain relief will actually hold on to our cable and lock everything into place. So that guy locks down in place, holds everybody nice and tight. There's not a ton of room on this side because our cable is gonna take up all that space. Here are all of our accessories that come in the kit. These two are gonna be mounting for the wall. These four are gonna mount the top cover plate to the box. And this is our installation hex. This is a four millimeter hex. Now we need to get our sheathing off of the outside here so that it'll fit through and wrap around. So I am going to use a razor blade and I'm gonna cut in between the neutral and the ground. Well, technically not a neutral in this case, it's gonna be a hot and we'll re-identify it as a hot very carefully not to push too deep. You see how we only cut about halfway through there and that score allowed us to open it up. I can see right there inside, it's not cut all the way through. Well, the external jacket on this cord is really thick. So I had to find some longer screws to attach the strain relief. I'm guessing that there's probably a different style strain relief or more than likely what I would need to do is drill the pilot hole bigger than the three quarter and go up to a one inch strain relief to mount on here, which I might look into in the future. But realistically, I plan to move this to the center of the garage and hardwire it. So for now, again, this is about, for now, this is gonna work. What you need is you need your wires to reach up and around onto our ground and our two load lugs. And the kit that you get comes, like I said, with this little adapter here. Now, ideally, you want to torque these lugs to the spec indicated right here, 50 pound foot inches, which is what I'm going to do with my torque wrench. Now, this is a micro torque wrench that goes, in this case, deca newton meters. So I'm going to use the 5.6 newton meters and do 56 deca, and I'll be good. There are also torque wrenches like what you would get here that are meant for electrical service work that are screwdriver torque wrenches that go down pretty low. This one goes down low enough for me in order to torque these and make sure that we're safe. What I'm also gonna do is re-identify my neutral with some identifying tape. Now this tape is backwards tape so that it will stick as I'm wrapping so that anybody in the future that might open this guy up knows that this is a hot leg, not a neutral. Now, any electrician opening this up in the future is gonna be laughing anyhow, but they would know that this system was two hot legs and this wasn't a neutral, but if a consumer or a handy house person in the future opened it up, you'd want them to know for sure that this was a hot leg. Now we need to strip these guys back and I'm gonna run the inside first. I'm gonna run my hot leg one, hot leg two, and then ground. And I don't wanna forget my zip tie that's gonna hold everybody in place on the side here. Now we need to strip this. I don't have wire strippers that go this large. So I am going to strip this manually. There is a strip indicator gauge right here of just how far you want to strip them. It's about a half of an inch. So same thing as the outside. I don't want to cut a bunch of copper on the inside. So I'm going to score it and break it with my thumb. Okay, you want to make sure that you get these guys all twisted together so that there isn't a bunch of extra hanging out anywhere. And also make sure that you're not 
pushing your insulation inside there because if you crimp down on the insulation, you don't have a good connection. Lock our wires down. I like to cut this flush so I'm not gonna scratch myself on it or anybody else. Strain relief is tight. I'm gonna have my camera guy hold this down in place while I torque each one of these. Good. Yep. That's why I walk up on it is so that I can give them the wiggles. Yeah, it's a lot more torque than you would think. It's 56. And hot leg two, 56. Okie dokie. So before I get the charger hooked up, I forgot to mention this is Rosie. This is my 2021. Tesla Model Y Performance. I recently picked this up with 84,000 miles on it, so we're gonna have quite a few projects to do on this car, which means I'm gonna be spending a couple of bucks at Tesla. So if you have gotten anything out of this video so far, whether you can give me a like, a subscribe, or even a comment down below, or if you're feeling super gracious and maybe you're looking to buy a Tesla, use my referral code and I'll get a couple of Tesla points to be able to buy stuff for Rosie. Rosie is from Rosie the Robot, from the Jetsons. If you've seen that, or if you're in my age bracket, you've seen that cartoon. Just thought it was fitting. I really liked that idea. Let's get back into getting our charger installed. Our screws, they look like a Phillips to some folks, but these are actually a square drive, or they could be like a PZ number two. I'm gonna use a square drive on them. Or a Accu drive or something. There's a special name for it but number two square drive works really well. Okay, and they've got those nice rubber washers on the back. It's gonna reach perfectly right here. So this is a good time to mention that I've read about a lot of these installs like this, and a lot of commenters say that this cord can be no longer than one foot because the actual control unit has GFCI in it. And I understand that. In my case, the one foot rule is not gonna work. So in your case, it may not. Again, not an electrician, so do this at your own risk. But understanding that I use a 25 foot extension cord on my welder, plasma cutter, and my powder coating oven, I'm gonna be okay with this six foot extension on here for now. Okay. Now we're in. I don't think Tesla anticipates a lot of homeowners installing this, but for those that do, that ball end works really well. As if this corner wasn't a mess already. I guess our next step is to plug it in, which is essentially like turning on my breaker. And then in your connector kit, you get these little startup guides with QR codes, and you need to log into the Tesla One app and actuate your charger. So let's do that next. This guy should light up because it's a lit handle go and there goes the charger into the app from our QR code and we're not sharing the QR code on the internet okay, it says press and hold the handle button for five seconds wait for the LED to pull screen then tap join one two okay we're pulsing green join okay now we're gonna join our network Okay, we're connected to the wall connector. Installation settings has one alert. We're gonna click to configure our settings. We're gonna pick our country. And we're gonna pick our breaker size, in this instance, 50 amps, which means we're gonna have a 20% less rating, so 40 amp max. Now we've got a green light. We've got our lights up over there. Technically, that means we can plug into the car. I'm gonna go ahead and connect it to my Wi-Fi system so that if it wants to do any updates, that it can. And then, well, now we gotta put some juice in the car. Okay, I did the commissioning. Somehow I put it back in commissioning mode. I held this for five seconds, I guess. Let's run this out to the car and see if we can do the things. I see people tap. I don't know what that means. Here. You have to unlock the car. I don't know. Go into the car, pop the door open. There it is. Okay, plug it in, it locked. 
See, it's blinking. I just heard that thing click inside. Oh, snap a dapple. That says we're charging. Should probably put the limit at 80. Uh, is it still at 100? Yeah. Okay, limit's at 80. Okay, it says six hours and 30 minutes remaining. We currently have 17 of 40 amps going in. I'm guessing it's gonna ramp up. Nothing on the screen because the car was asleep. Now it says four hours, 32 amps, seven kilowatts, 40 amps. Woo! Now we've got Woo. nine kilowatts going in. It says four hours and 35 minutes. I am charging during the daytime because it's the weekend and my power stays the same cost through the weekend. Typically, I would charge at night. But let's see how long this actually takes. So we've been charging for an hour and a half already. I've got my FLIR app up and it's seeing my arm right now, my FLIR one on the back here. And I can look to see that, yep, the charger is warm, the cable is warm, and my extension cable is warm. I'm looking at about, I don't know, 95, 98 degrees there. The cable itself runs up to the unit. Same temperature there. But then the plug right next to it, it's about the same temperature too. It's running my camera up on top of the garage. When I go outside, the car, the surface of the car is 157 degrees, but my cable is actually much cooler at 130. So it's hot, but it's also pushing a ton of juice. Let's take a look at our breaker. When you look at the panel, you can see we've got one breaker pulling a bunch of juice, and that's right there. That's my 50 amp but it's not pulling anything excessive. It's about 140 degrees, where my box here just sitting is 120 degrees. So I'm gonna go with that's probably not gonna be too big of a deal. If you are an electrician down in the comments, you tell me, is that too hot for it to get? It's 100 degrees outside. I imagine that thing's gonna get pretty warm with all that juice flowing through it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and sit back, relax, let this thing continue to charge and then see what we have. Well, I forgot to film an outro to this video because I just left the car hooked up and went to bed, but it did charge up overnight and was ready for me in the morning. I've now charged it a second time and I've spent a total of $8 or thereabouts. I pay about 14 to 15 cents on average per kilowatt, even at night when you add in all the fees and everything that APS charges. So I'm following it here on the app and I can see my home charge, $6. One time I charged here, it says $2. I don't know why it says other. And then my one supercharger charging uh, event. So I've spent a total of $34 to charge this thing and drive around about hundred miles so far. I don't know if that's good or bad just yet because I don't have a relevant comparison, but I've got a charger on the wall. It reaches this spot, that spot and potentially that spot. If you found this helpful, ask again, like, subscribe, comment, help a brother out, use my Tesla referral code, or you could buy anything from one of my Amazon links down below. I do get a small benefit from that and you don't pay anything extra. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it.